Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Arthur Carty. I'm the Executive Director of the Waterloo Institute for Nanotechnology, and it's a pleasure to introduce our seminar speaker for today, Dr. Anton van der Ven. Uh, Dr. van der Ven uh, was born in Belgium, and he attended the Catholic University of Leuven, where he studied intelligence <coughs> and applied material science. He did his PhD work with uh, Professor Gerbrand Seder at MIT in material science, and he stayed on at MIT as a postdoctoral fellow until his appointment uh, as assistant professor of material science and engineering at the University of Michigan, as you see here. <coughs> and that's, of course, where he's currently located. His research interests lie in the general area of prediction of materials properties through first principles, computation, and uh, modeling. But perhaps a better indication of what he does is provided by the titles of uh, three recent papers I've selected here. Uh, surface order of nanostructured compound 3,5 semiconductor alloys in FISREV uh, B2009. Uh, Non-dilute diffusion in layered intercalation compounds LIXTIS2 in FISREV B2008. And ordering in lithium nickel manganese oxide and its relation to charge capacity and electrochemical behavior in rechargeable lithium batteries in electrochemistry uh, communications. Dr. Van der Ven uh, is a participant in two large United States Department of Energy basic science projects on chemical energy storage and solar and thermal energy conversion. Today he's going to talk about the thermodynamics and kinetics of lithium intercalation compounds and hydrides from first principles. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for, for that nice uh, welcome and the nice introduction. Um, I won't reread the title. Um, but just highlight a few points. Um, we're interested in predicting thermodynamics and kinetics, and those are <coughs> really macroscopic properties, uh, starting from first principles, so the basic laws of physics at the atomic and the electronic structure. And uh, two, two real, a real passion of mine is to, to be able to understand, in essence, non-equilibrium phenomena, and in particular phase transformations in solids. Um, and we can make a distinction between two types of uh, phase transformations. One are diffusional phase transformations, which involves redistribution of atoms. So when you have some uh, change of state, uh, the atoms have to redistribute throughout the solid. And another one is a structural phase transformation, where the crystal structure actually undergoes um, uh, major changes in its, in its structure. Um, studying each of these um, from first principles is already a challenge and if you go to real transformations that occur in, in real systems you'll see that most phase transformations actually involve diffu atoms diffusing around, rearranging, as well as crystal structures changing. So the real challenge is to, to treat real systems that undergo both diffusional and structural phase transformations. Um, a very nice application to, to witness these kinds of phase transformations is in a lithium-ion battery. Lithium-ion battery is a very unique device because it, uh, compared to other technologies, it relies on materials not in their dead state, kind of in their equilibrium state, but rather in their dynamic state. Every time you use a lithium battery, you're forcing the material to undergo changes, and that's in contrast to most other technologies. Um, a typical lithium battery consists of uh, an anode, which is nowadays typically graphite, uh, you've got a cathode, which is some transition metal oxide. Um, and you start out in the charged state with lithium ions residing between these graphitic sheets. But thermodynamically, they would much rather reside in this uh, transition metal oxide host. Well, what you do is you insert a membrane, an electrolyte, that only allows lithium plus ions to pass through. And that forces electrons to go through an external circuit. Um, and so, you can, in a controlled manner, through controlling the external circuit, you can allow the lithium ions to trickle through this uh, electrolyte and fill up this uh, uh, transition metal oxide and thereby gain enormous amount of uh, chemical energy. And so you're essentially converting chemical energy to electrical work. Well, when you do that, you're, you're moving lithium ions. You're changing the composition of these two electrode materials quite drastically. You start with a fully intercalated, fully lithiated graphite phase and you have to remove all lithium ions going to a completely deintercalated graphitic phase. And so, first of all, what's happening is you're, you're forcing the material to undergo um, changes in its electronic structure because the lithium ions actually donate its electrons to this host and thereby affect the electronic structure. 
but you're also really testing phase stability because these graphitic sheets have a particular stacking arrangement when, when, uh, when there's nothing in between them, but when you stick lithium ions between them, you undergo a different stacking sequence change. So you have to undergo phase transformations uh, every time you uh, remove and reinsert lithium ions. And obviously the rate with which you can uh, charge and discharge a battery is determined by kinetics. So how fast can you remove the lithium ions uh, from these materials and reinsert them? And uh, the kinetics of these phase transformations that occur when you change composition um, also affect all kinds of things such as cycle lifetime, how often you can charge and discharge it. So I'm going to focus on uh, these intercalation compounds and show how we can predict a variety of uh, important fundamental properties. Um, let me just give you a, 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 a little bit of an overview of, of typical crystal structures. This is a typical layered uh, cathode material comes in these kinds of chemistries, lithium cobalt oxide, lithium titanium disulfide, which is one of the first ones, and then uh, more complicated chemistries such as lithium nickel manganese oxide. And these kinds of compounds, they, they form as layered structures. Uh, the corner points of these octahedra correspond to oxygen ions. The transition metal ions are at the center of these octahedra, and then you can insert lithium between uh, these sheets. Another example of an uh, important cathode material is this lithium iron phosphate, which is a little more complicated. Again, you have these octahedra, with iron is surrounded by oxygen. You've got phosphate groups. And then the lithium ions uh, insert and can be removed actually from linear channels. So uh, very anisotropic kind of crystal structure. And this is uh, another example. Uh, if you take the titanates, for example, titanium dioxide, uh, they can form in a whole variety of different crystal structures and they've got all this empty space in which you can insert lithium. So keeping the chemistry the same, you can really change structure and actually change uh, the, the electrochemical behavior of these materials. So one thing that, that I really like about lithium ion batteries is that um, doing a, a measurement of just the voltage gives you direct access to very abstract thermodynamic quantities. So things like the chemical potential, something that's used to always be very abstract to me, but comes directly out of a voltage measurement. It turns out that the voltage, if you take a, a kind of experimental electrochemical cell where you use lithium metal as the anode and then your, your, some material that you'd use as a cathode, uh, some host that can, that can accommodate lithium ions as the cathode, well then the voltage that you would measure across this elec electrochemical cell is uh, essentially minus the difference in the lithium chemical potential of this host minus that of the lithium chemical potential in metallic lithium. And this is really a constant if you're dealing with metallic lithium. So you're really measuring the electrochemical, the uh, chemical uh, potential of the lithium ions in this material. So essentially what you're getting is um, the, the, the chemical potential we can derive from the Gibbs free energy. For intercalation compounds, it's the derivative of the Gibbs free energy with it respect to its composition. So essentially when you measure the voltage uh, and you integrate that voltage, you can directly get these abstract quantities like Gibbs free energies, just directly by performing the experiment. So a very nice uh, property of this electrochemical cell. Very direct way to measure properties. And so you can see all kinds of interesting features. I'm not sure if, if you have the background to interpret this kind of a diagram. This is a, a free energy diagram as a function of lithium composition. So you start with no lithium over here, you fully intercalate it over here. You fill all the interstitial sites, for example. If you have this kind of a free energy curve, there's going to be a region where you have two phase coexistence. Because if you have some, if you're between x1 and x2 as in your bulk composition, in your electrode material, the free energy of having kind of a uniform mixture of lithium ions throughout the crystal is higher than that of having part of it at x1, at this composition, and another part at a higher composition, so kind of a two-phase mixture. Well, if you have this kind of a, a free energy curve, um, the way that translates into a voltage curve is because its voltage is directly related to the slope minus the slope of this free energy plot. Uh, initially, you have largely varying uh, slope, so you get this uh, change in the, in, the, in the voltage curve, but inside the two-phase region, the chemical potential is essentially this common tangent, which stays fixed, and you end up with a plateau in your, in your voltage curve. So immediately, just by noticing plateaus in your voltage curve, you can immediately see that you have two-phase coexistence. So you see uh, quite a bit about the, th the thermodynamic behavior and, and stability behavior of this material. If it turns out that at some intermediate composition, another phase has a lower free energy, some stable phase appears, um, that will break that common tangent, you'll end up with two common tangents, and your voltage curve will now have two plateaus with a step in between, which signifies the, the stability of this intermediate phase. So you can immediately kind of um, map out phase diagrams, stability maps, 
uh, of these materials just by measuring the voltage and interpreting uh, these, these plateaus. So to give you an example, let's, let's come to a concrete system, lithium cobalt oxide, which uh, technologically is still a very important material. Um, this is the voltage curve. If you start over here, this is, this is capacity, but essentially over here, this is the fully lithiated compound. So the lithium ions completely fill the crystal structure. And here you've completely removed all the lithium ions. You see a lot of features already. You see uh, plateaus, which signify two-phase regions. Um, here we have a plateau between a fully lithiated phase and a phase with a lot of vacancies. Here this signifies kind of solid solution behavior. Notice here we have a step. The step arises from lithium ordering. So there's that intermediate phase where the lithium ions uh, energetically prefer to line up in rows separated by rows of vacancies. This is a, a 2D plot of what the lithium ions are doing in these layers. They, they reside on triangular lattice. And if you continue, you still have kind of solid solution behavior here. Um, but then over here, you have a little step. And again, what happens here is that the lithium ions again order. And this time, they order perpendicular to the c-axis, perpendicular to these uh, slabs. And what you see is that alternating layers are filled with lithium ions, and then the remaining layers are empty. And this is actually a, a phase that, uh, that we predicted from first principles before the measurements, before actually experimental refinements were done to, to characterize uh, material. So this is an example where the techniques I would describe actually helped uh, characterize what's going on in this material. And then if you remove all the lithium ions, you end up with this phase, and that's, that's over here. So that's kind of the, the basics about thermodynamics, which you can directly get out of uh, doing a voltage curve measurement of your material. Dynamics is also very important. It determines how fast you can charge and discharge. And there, uh, typically your electrode consists of little ceramic particles, kind of composite of ceramic particles. And, and often the bottleneck of charging and discharging is being able to remove and reinsert the lithium ions into the particles. And uh, so, for example, if, you, if this is one of your particles and you're charging, you're removing lithium from the surface of your particle. What happens is if you plot the composition inside, the lithium composition inside this particle, so this is uh, position inside this particle, and then this is the lithium composition. If you're removing lithium from the surface, you're depleting the surface from with, uh, of lithium ions, and uh, that, in, that creates uh, concentration gradients within the particle, and these concentration gradients then, according to Fick's first law, drive diffusion. They essentially drive uh, the diffusion of lithium ions from the center to the surface of the particle where they can then be extracted. And the rate with which you can therefore extract lithium ions from in inside the particle is determined by the diffusion coefficient. The higher your diffusion coefficient, that means the more mobile the lithium ions, uh, the more rapidly you can charge and discharge the material. That's assuming your, your particle is a, is a solid solution. If we come back to this kind of a, a free energy curve, where you predict kind of two phases coexisting at intermediate composition, the kinetic mechanism is different. Um, there you're going to have actually a phase transformation. So you're going to form a new phase that's then going to grow and consume the old phase. So if you have uh, two phases that can, that can coexist at intermediate composition, if you start in the charge state, fully lithiated, and you start removing lithium ions, um, what happens is that on the surface where you're depleting the lithium composition, the lithium ions, um, the alpha phase will nucleate and grow, and it will continue to grow inward consuming the beta phase. So if we plot now the composition inside this particle, again for this kind of free energy curve, you see that in the interior you still have the beta phase with a high lithium composition. You still have internal gradients which drive diffusion from the center to the interface. And then here we've got at the outer side, outer edges of the crystallite, uh, alpha phase with a low lithium composition. Now, in this case, uh, the kinetics of this reaction are not only determined by diffusion in the single phase regions, but also migration of these interfaces. How fast do these interfaces uh, move? And another thing is, notice that across the interface, there's an abrupt jump in composition because you have alpha phase coexisting with the beta phase. They have different compositions. And these electrode materials are very, they depend very strongly. Their lattice parameters depend very strongly on the composition. So usually if, if you have more lithium, the lattice parameters are larger. So over here you expect larger lattice parameters. And then suddenly across this interface, the lattice parameters have to contract. So you build up enormous elastic uh, stresses and strains um, by the creation of these interfaces, which can lead to fracture of your particle, so degra mechanical degradation of your particle. And it appears that the more rapidly you, you, you uh, try to move these interfaces, uh, the easier it is to introduce these, um, uh, to, to start creating mechanical degradation. So let's come back to, to this lithium iron phosphate. Um, 
if you look at its, its voltage curve, um, it clearly shows a plateau, uh, which indicates a two-phase reaction. In a sense, what happens is you have the fully lithiated phase, um, and if you remove lithium through, through a first-order phase transformation, it transforms, as I, as I described in the previous slide, to this alpha phase when you, when you uh, remove lithium ions. And so if you take a, a, partic a particular uh, crystallite, uh, sometimes they're shaped in this form, um, something peculiar about this crystal structure is that the lithium diffusion only occurs in one direction. Uh, and it turns out uh, in this, in this uh, geometry, the uh, axis along which the lithium ions diffuse is along this B axis, so it's perpendicular to this face right here. So when you're extracting lithium, what you'd expect uh, kind of naively is that uh, you'd extract lithium from these surfaces because that's where the diffusion tunnels, the, the tunnels in which lithium ions reside, uh, emerge from. Uh, and then you form the alpha phase on the surface, and that then grows inward by migration of this interface that consumes the beta phase. But um, it, it, there's some evidence that this, this mechanism doesn't occur. It's actually a lot more complicated, and in large part because of the complexity and the anisotropy of these crystallites, what happens, at least in large crystallites that are chemically delithiated, is that um, you, you get this lamellar structure um, where the lamellae are, are, are parallel, or the, the interfaces between the lamellae are parallel to the diffusion direction. So it's not a, it's not a very in efficient mechanism of removing lithium ions because the only place you can remove lithium ions is at this interface, and it's these interfaces that are now moving laterally. So very inefficient mechanism, but nevertheless the system follows that, that route uh, even though this is kinetically much more efficient. And the reason for that is because of coherency strains. It turns out that the lattice parameters of both of these phases, the alpha and beta, are very different, which introduce enormous coherency strains that allows this, that causes this phase to be, uh, this morphology during the phase transformation to be adopted. And I can illustrate that. So if we take um, a, a free energy curve for this crystallite, for, for uh, olivine, you've got the two local wells, one for the alpha phase and one for the beta phase. Um, if you have just two-phase coexistence, the free energy of the two-phase mixture would be along this common tangent line, kind of just a, a, a mixture of the, of the phases. But if you look at, if you now account for the coherency strain energy, so what has to happen here is that because the alpha and the beta phases are coherently matched, uh, one phase has to be stretched and the other one has to be contracted uh, in order for this interface, for the crystallographic continuity along this interface. If you now calculate the strain energy, you get this green curve, so it's kind of an addition to this common tangent. And if you look at this more complicated, kinetically less efficient morphology, um, you see that the coherency strain energy is significantly lower because what happens is that the largest misfit strain is along the A-axis, uh, and in this morphology, that misfit strain can be uh, completely relaxed. So clearly, a lot of complexity. So we have thermodynamics. If you do a voltage curve measurement, you can immediately detect all kinds of issues about phase stability. Uh, we've got these phase transformations. We've got diffusion and uh, this complexity of anisotropy and coherency strains that selects out non-intuitive kind of two-phase morphologies during these reactions. It gets even more complicated when you go to the uh, nanoscale. So this is an illustration of, of a voltage curve of anatase titanium dioxide, uh, very recent. Um, and this is the voltage curve when you go to the nanoscale. So you notice there's some noticeable differences. Um, first of all, uh, there's, there's a lot of hysteresis in, in the bulk particles. Also, the capacity keeps reducing every time you charge and discharge, whereas in, at the nanoscale that isn't the case. But also you see a lot of uh, slight changes in the voltage curve as well, so more sloping voltage curves uh, as compared to the bulk material. And so in these nanoparticles, at least what we believe to first order, is that the surfaces of your particles play an important role. They're, they're present uh, in, in much larger quantity than in the bulk phase. And the behavior of the surfaces is different from that of the bulk. And if you have nanoparticles, obviously you have much more surfaces. Um, so there's a lot of questions. Um, and I, I won't answer them, but I'm just going to put them out there. Um, first of all, about how thermodynamics is affected at the nanoscale. And it's not at this point clear how we how we're supposed to um, analyze that and rationalize it from a theoretical point of view. And, and there's another question about kinetics. Can we extrapolate the kinetics I described on the, on the previous slides to the um, nanoscale? Is it, is it possible, does the nanoscale, do we also have these two-phase reactions where the interface migrates into the, into the crystal, into the crystallite when alpha consumes the beta phase? Or, because it's at the nanoscale, are we dealing with 
kind of fluctuations in composition, just as in a nucleation event, where suddenly the alpha transforms through a kind of a, a fluctuation into the beta phase. So a lot of open questions about the nanoscale. Okay, so I've kind of given an overview of all the, uh, or, or a few of the important issues of uh, lithium-ion batteries. Um, the question is, how much and what of this uh, and how can we predict this starting from the electronic structure? Well, for me, the starting point is really a very basic level. It's uh, solving the Schrodinger equation. Um, we can't do it exactly for these many body problems, for these complicated materials, but we can rely on a very useful theory called density functional theory, which kind of maps this complicated many body Schrodinger equation um, onto uh, more manageable single electron uh, Schrodinger equations, where you're solving for uh, the wave functions of single electrons at a time um, within a few approximations. So I list them, I'm not going to explain them, but common approximations are the local density approximation, generalized gradient approximation, which approximate kind of um, the complex interactions uh, resulting from pile exclusion principles and kind of correlated electron behavior. The point is that uh, very to, to a high degree of accuracy, we can uh, solve for the electronic structure of real solids nowadays. The problem, though, is that the output of these kinds of um, schemes uh, is very basic information. So we can calculate energies. We can calculate the energy of two different crystal structures and thereby see which one is more stable than the other one. We can predict uh, equilibrium lattice parameters. Um, and we can um, plot, for example, electronic charge densities. This is of lithium cobalt oxide, um, showing where the uh, electron uh, goes when you add lithium to a host material. And these kinds of plots can give you insight about the, the character, the nature of bonding between the ions in your crystal structure. But it's very basic kind of information what we're interested in is trying to describe um, the behavior of uh, battery materials, uh, which are occur at, which are used at finite temperature. Uh, everything is thermally activated, so temperature and entropy play an important role. So we have to somehow include these effects if we want to accurately describe uh, behavior of electrode materials, both thermodynamically and kinetically. So if we, at a macroscopic level we want to analyze phase stability. Well, to analyze phase stability at finite temperature, we have to compare free energies as a function of temperature or as a function of composition. But we want to do that starting from solutions to the Schrodinger equation. And in order to link these macroscopic phenomenological theories of thermodynamics and kinetics to energies, energetics, that we can calculate by solving the Schrodinger equation, we have to resort to statistical mechanics, um, where the key equation is this partition function, which uh, is essentially um, a sum over the exponent of the energies, which we calculate from first principles, solving the Schrodinger equation, of all kinds of excitations that occur in the solid um, in, at finite temperature, divided by the, the, the KT, the Boltzmann's constant times the temperature. So each of these energies are the energies of different excitations. And in solids, in, in battery materials, the important excitations are obviously, first of all, electronic excitations. So kind of electrons are excited from the conduction band, or the valence band to the conduction band. Um, other ones are, are vibrational excitations, where they correspond to the excitations of, of atoms vibrating around their equilibrium positions. But most importantly, for lithium ion batteries, the, the key excitations that contribute to your free energies are what are called configurational uh, excitations or configurational degrees of freedom. And these arise from all the possible ways of distributing lithium ions and vacancies throughout your crystal. So if you have a, a lithium uh, intercalation compound, you're at some intermediate lithium composition. You've got a large number of uh, lithium vacancies. The lithium ions and the vacancies can rearrange in all kinds of uh, uh, configurations. And those, uh, the entropy that arises from that plays an important role in uh, determining the free energies. So we have to really account for these excitations if we want to describe finite temperature properties in these materials. Well, to do that, we need a kind of a mathematical description of configurations in a crystal. And we can do that by uh, introducing what are called occupation variables. So let's take, for example, the, the lithium layer of an intercalation compound at some intermediate composition. Assume that the red balls are lithium and the green ones are vacancies. Well, we can um, mathematically characterize or, or represent this arrangement of atoms by introducing occupation variables to each site, which is a plus one if there's a lithium ion at that site and a minus one if there's a vacancy there. So what we can do is we can map this particular configuration onto an array of plus ones and minus ones, and thereby rigorously mathematically uh, characterize uh, ordering in this crystal, or disorder. And it turns out that um, 
the, uh, these occupation variables have very uh, interesting and, and, and useful mathematical properties because if you take products of occupation variables belonging to different sites that belong to a cluster, so for example, you take the occupation variable at site I multiplied by the occupation, site, occupation variable at site J, you create a polynomial of these corresponding to this cluster and if you take all possible polynomials in this way, so belonging to pair clusters, triplet clusters, and so forth, the collection of all these possible polynomials forms a complete and orthonormal basis in this configuration space. And that means that any property that depends on how the lithium ions are arranged in your crystal can be rigorously expanded in terms of these basis functions. So for example, the energy of your crystal, of your integration compound, will depend on how the lithium ions are ordered. If they're all segregated to one side and the vacancies are on the other side, you're going to have a different energy than if they're kind of mixed. Um, so the energy of the crystal will depend on how the lithium ions are ordered. Well, we can, in terms of these polynomial basis functions, we can expand that energy, right? The energy, dependence of that energy on how the atoms are arranged as an expansion of these basis functions, these polynomials, where we've got these expansion coefficients, these Vs. Okay, so this is a very useful tool to be able to represent um, uh, properties of, of this crystal as a function of configuration. So having introduced that, let me kind of give you a flow chart of how we link solutions to the Schrodinger equation to macroscopic thermodynamic properties. There's three steps to it. The first step is we perform many, but uh, in, in, in a statistical mechanical sense actually a few, um, computationally very demanding first principles computations, so solving the Schrodinger equation. We use the, ener the, the results of these few excitations to parameterize one of these cluster expansions, which we can then use in Monte Carlo simulations, where we can then simulate the partition function, and from that we can then extract thermodynamic properties. Okay? So let me illustrate this for a particular example, just to make it more concrete. And let me talk about lithium titanium disulfide. So uh, not the most important intercalation compound anymore, uh, its voltage is much too low. But it, it does have very uh, good kinetic properties. Um, and it has a crystal structure that uh, many other intercalation compounds have as well. And it's also interesting in the fact that most intercalation compounds used as batteries nowadays rely on oxides, ox oxygen, instead of sulfur. So it's an interesting system to, to study uh, at a fundamental level to see how uh, changes from oxygen to sulfur affect, for example, diffusion. So let me, what we're going to do is we're going to go through these steps just to illustrate it. The first step is to calculate the energies of a few excitations, and that's shown here. These are the formation energies. These are each a result of, a, of solving a Schrodinger equation. Each point here corresponds to the energy of a particular arrangement of lithium ions in the crystal. Um, and so, for example, at 50%, you've got many possible ways of, of arranging half the sites with lithium and half with vacancies. Each point corresponds to a different arrangement. They've all got different energies. And so we've got about 200 of these energies. We use that then to parameterize one of these expansions. Um, so we've got pair interactions extending up to, I think, about the eighth or ninth na nearest neighbor, They're kind of illustrated here. And we've got a bunch of triplet uh, clusters, interactions, and then, and then quadruplet interactions. So this Hamiltonian now, this cluster expansion, allows us now to calculate, kind of extrapolate those expensive first principles energies to any kind of arrangement of lithium ions and vacancies. And then if we implement that in Monte Carlo simulations, we can then actually predict thermodynamic properties. So we can calculate, for example, the temperature composition uh, phase diagram, where this is the lithium composition, this is the temperature. And essentially in this material, uh, there's, there's not much interesting, there's not much uh, ordering going on between lithium ions and vacancies. It's mostly a solid solution. But there is a staging phase at low lithium composition, uh, whereby the lithium ions segregate to alternating layers, leaving other layers empty. And that's illustrated here. And here we have a, a two-phase region. And we can also predict the voltage curve. This is the voltage curve coming directly out of Monte Carlo. Um, this is step corresponds to the staged phase. We've got the plateau because of this two-phase region. And then mostly um, solid solution kind of behavior over here. And we can predict other thermodynamic quantities, such as uh, Gibbs free energy and uh, the enthalpy as a function of lithium composition. And uh, here, this is the entropy. Notice that. I'm comparing it to kind of an ideal solution entropy where atoms are assumed to be completely random, the entropy of a, a random mixture. And you see that the entropy is lower than that of um, an ideal solution, implying that there are um, there's some degree of short range order which always reduces uh, your entropy. And here it's quite a bit lower, and that's because of this ordering along the c axis. So that's one system. Um, 
we've done it to, with, a, with a whole variety of systems. This is uh, a lithium titanium, uh, titanium 204, which is a spinello crystal structure, different crystal structure, not layered. Um, this is the uh, calculated voltage curve, and we're comparing it to experimental measurements that were done quite a while ago. Um, notice qualitatively, uh, the shape, the predicted shape of the voltage curve is in very good agreement with, with experiment. So we've got a, a plateau in agreement with experiment, a large step, and then kind of a sloping voltage curve um, over here. And so because of, because of the, um, because this technique can be used to, to accurately predict these voltage curves, we can also use it to explore things that might be much more difficult to, to make experimentally. So you might wonder what's the uh, voltage curve like if you take a bundle of nanotubes and, and you might want to know what the dependence is uh, of the voltage on kind of the nanotube diameter or the chirality of your nanotube. Well, using these techniques, we can, we can uh, calculate the voltage curves of arising from inserting lithium between these interstitial sites uh, of your bundle of nanotubes. And it's kind of illustrated here, where you see um, some variety in the voltage curve depending on, um, on the uh, dimensions, kind of the diameter and the chirality of your, of your uh, nanotube. Um, and so you could imagine, you might want to consider whether you want to make a kind of microelectronic battery consisting of nanotube bundles. Uh, before you want to actually try to make this, you could first calculate the voltage to see whether it's worthwhile, worth all your effort. Okay, so that's um, kind of the thermodynamics. Let me say something about uh, uh, diffusion. So remember the rate with which you can charge and discharge a battery depends on uh, the diffusion coefficient. The more mobile the lithium ions, the faster you can charge and discharge your battery. Well, it turns out that if you take your chemical diffusion coefficient from um, the fixed first law, uh, you, what you can do is you can um, write it as a product of a self-diffusion coefficient times a thermodynamic factor. And your thermodynamic factor is, has, has this form. It's the derivative of your chemical potential with respect to the log of the composition. And essentially is a measure for the uh, degree of uh, thermodynamic non-ideality. So the, the more non-ideal your, your uh, material is, the larger this thermodynamic factor. And when it's thermodynamically ideal, the thermodynamic factor is 1. Your self-diffusion coefficient has this form, and is really a, a measure for the mobility of the lithium ion. So I'll, I'll explain this e equation in, in a later slide. But let me just uh, kind of illustrate what this thermodynamic factor looks like. So coming back to lithium titanium disulfide, this is, this is what it looks like. You've got, um, uh, this is the lithium composition. Uh, when, you've, when you're very dilute, um, you're your thermodynamic factor is one, but notice away from uh, dilute, when you add more lithium, the lithium ions start to interact, you deviate from thermodynamic ideality, and you get about a factor of 10, and then when it's stoichiometric, you're, you deviate quite strongly from ideality, so you get this divergence in your thermodynamic factor. So that comes directly from this um, chemical potential or the voltage curve. So the other part of diffusion, so that's the thermodynamic factor, the other part is, is the, diffu the self-diffusion coefficient. And that's its expression. And, and so a very nice thing about um, studying kinetic properties in these materials is that um, you, you don't have to actually um, simulate a, a non-equilibrium event. So you don't have to actually simulate the case where you have uh, gradients in your material. Uh, it turns out that for these kinds of um, kinetic coefficients, you can cal calculate them with a, what's called a Kubo-Green um, relationship, which um, allows you to calculate kinetic coefficients by looking at fluctuations that occur at equilibrium. So if you have a crystal um, and it's in equilibrium, the lithium ions are still constantly moving around. And if you keep track of the um, center of mass of those lithium ions, um, then the, um, the, the measure of that, the, the mobility of that center of mass is related to your uh, self-diffusion coefficient. So let me just illustrate that. Assume you have two lithium ions. After a certain time, they've, they've kind of wandered around through this crystal and they've performed some trajectory. If you connect the endpoints of that trajectory, you get these delta R sub I, R sub I's for each of these lithium ions. You sum them up, you square that, and then you divide by the number of lithium ions, and then you divide by the time. And D is the dimension, which in this case is two. So you're essentially looking at a random walk of the center of mass of all your lithium ions. And the more, uh, the more this, this center of mass kind of migrates at equilibrium, the more mobile the lithium ions are, and the easier it is to insert and remove lithium ions under non-equilibrium conditions. So it's a very useful technique to, to predict kinetic properties just by looking at fluctuations at equilibrium. Um, but if we want to be able to simulate these, and we can do that with uh, a technique called kinetic Monte Carlo simulations, we have to also be able to describe these elementary hops. And so let me, um, uh, so what we have to do is we have to be able to describe elementary hops. 
And we can do that with a technique called transition state theory, which um, allows us to, to look at, predict the frequency with which a lithium ion hops from one site to an adjacent vacant site as essentially a product of a vibrational frequency, uh, which we can calculate from first principles, times the exponent of this migration barrier, so minus delta E sub B divided by KT. Now, a complexity in lithium ion batteries is that you're looking at diffusion in the non-dilute limit. We've got lithium ions migrating and sampling many different environments. And during this process, as, as this lithium ion migrates through the crystal, this migration barrier is constantly going to be changing. Some environments, it's going to be more difficult to migrate. In other ones, it's going to be uh, easier. You're going to get a smaller barrier. So we have to uh, include that, that effect in, in any calculation of diffusion. So let me just illustrate some, some of this complexity. Um, and, and let's look at, uh, again, lithium titanium disulfide. So if you want to have a lithium ion migrate from one octahedral site to an adjacent octahedral site, vacant site, um, the, the way it does that is actually passing through an adjacent tetrahedral site, because that's the least theoretically hindered uh, pathway. Uh, so it, has the, it performs this curved hop. Well, the consequence of this crystal structure, which forces this per curved hop uh, on this lithium ion, is it makes, that, makes the uh, migration barrier for lithium diffusion, very sensitive on the local arrangement of other lithium ions around it. So for example, if we take this layer and just illustrate different uh, local arrangements around the lithium ion. So for example, this lithium ion wants to hop to this vacant site. This is the triangular lattice in, in these layers. Um, these are the octahedral sites. They're all occupied in this case, except for this vacancy. And these green triangles correspond to adjacent tetrahedral sites. And so if you want to hop from here to that vacancy, so essentially do a hop like this, you have to perform this curved hop where you have to pass through this tetrahedral site. Well, in this tetrahedral site, you come very close to another lithium ion. So you, you have enormous uh, uh, electrostatic repulsion between two lithium ions. And you can expect that the migration barrier is going to be very high in that case. If you take another arrangement where you introduce another vacancy, so you've got now a die vacancy, um, you've got two non-equivalent paths now. One is the same as before. You still come close to this lithium ion. But in this case, it performs a curved hop. Uh, next to a vacancy. So you don't have this electrostatic repulsion anymore. And so you can expect that the migration barrier for this hop is going to be significantly lower than, than for this hop. So the, the local ordering around the migrating lithium ion is going to have an effect on this migration barrier. And we can calculate these barriers by just solving the Schrodinger equation as this lithium ion migrates from one side to the next. You see in this case, this is the migration barrier. Uh, when it's in the tetrahedral site, there's a slight local minimum. But notice that the, the overall the migration barrier is quite high. It's about almost, it's about 0.7 EV, um, which is uh, quite high for these intercalation compounds. But if you look or in this geometry, where you have two vacancies now, uh, we still have the same hop. The migration barrier looks very similar as, as in this case, uh, still about 0.7 EV. But in, in the other path, path two, where it passes by this vacancy, the migration barrier is, is uh, significantly lower. And in fact, the tetrahedral site is actually a local minimum, which implies that lithium ions that migrate can actually thermalize uh, before actually hopping on. And there's a chance that they actually hop back. Um, so clearly, the local arrangement is very important in determining these migration barriers. Let me just illustrate why, that, why it is important. So for example, if you're at some 50% comp percent composition, uh, so you've, you've removed half of the lithium ions, this is a typical lithium vacancy arrangement. So you've got some disorder. And uh, all these lithium ions can perform hops. So let's look at this one, for example. This one wants to perform, wants to hop to this vacancy. Um, there's no die vacancies here. Uh, so when it performs these curved hops, it's going to come very close to these lithium ions and have large electrostatic repulsion and therefore a large migration barrier. So you can expect this to be a, a, a low probability event. If you take this lithium ion, which hops to that vacancy, uh, this vacancy belongs to one die vacancy. You can perform these two curved hops. One passes by this lithium ion, so it's kind of high migration barrier. This one passes by a vacant site. There's no electrostatic repulsion, so it has a much lower um, uh, migration barrier. So most, most of these hops will occur along this path. And then this lithium ion, which can hop uh, into this vacancy, this vacancy belongs to two die vacancies, so it has these two low barrier uh, migration barriers. So you can see that different, depending on where the lithium ion is, um, it's going to have different local mobilities, so different migration barriers. And if we want to rigorously predict the diffusion coefficients at, at, uh, at the macroscopic level, we have to capture all of these effects um, in kinetic Monte Carlo simulations. There's one more level of complexity, and that is that um, dimensionally, this crystal also changes in terms of its lattice parameters. So when you 
uh, extract more and more lithium ions, what happens is the C lattice parameter, so it's the lattice parameter perpendicular to these slabs, uh, starts to contract. And what that does is it penalizes this activated state more than it does the end states. Um, and so what happens is, and these are again first principles calculations, this is the energy all normalized to zero, or rescaled to zero for the octahedral site. And this is the energy in the tetrahedral site. And then this barrier is when it passes through this triangle of oxygen ions. Um, what happens is as you remove more and more lithium ions, so this is the lithium composition. Here, this is a high composition. This is the low composition. What happens is the C lattice parameter contracts and it causes these migration barriers to steadily increase. So you, you, you uh, start slowing down the lithium mobility uh, with uh, decreasing lithium composition. So again, that's something we also have to account for. So putting all this information, so we, we capture, uh, using our cluster expansion techniques, we, we capture the environment dependence of these barriers uh, within our kinetic Monte Carlo simulations. And then by evaluating these cobalt green expressions, we can calculate um, the diffusion coefficient as a function of lithium composition. This is the thermodynamic factor, which I already showed. And then this is the calculated um, diffusion coefficients. One is a tracer diffusion coefficient. And this one is the self-diffusion coefficient, which is, is this quantity right here. And when you take the product, we can get the chemical diffusion coefficient, and uh, we get this red curve. So something to notice about, about this, um, this diffusion coefficient is it varies by several orders of magnitude with lithium composition. So you get enormous changes in the lithium mobility as you change the lithium composition. Um, at, at high lithium composition, it's, it's reasonably low, and then it increases to intermediate composition, at intermediate compositions, and then drops off. And the reason for this composition dependence is, is twofold. This, this decrease over here in the diffusion coefficient is because as we remove lithium ions, the C lattice parameter contracts, that, makes the, that increases the migration barriers, makes the lithium ions less mobile. They're hard, it's harder to diffuse as the lattice parameter uh, contracts. Um, the reason it de decreases at higher composition is because diffusion is mediated by a die vacancy mechanism. I don't know if I have the, I, yeah, I don't have the slide here. Essentially, um, remember that the die vacancy has a, has a lower migration barrier. And it turns out that most of the hops in this system are mediated by die vacancies. Almost 100% of the hops are mediated by die vacancies. As you increase the lithium composition, you're decreasing the vacancy composition. And you're increasing the dye vacancy composition even more because that scales as x squared, the, or, or the vacancy composition squared. So this, this decrease in the, um, in the diffusion coefficient is a result of, of uh, kind of starving the system of its, of its diffusion mediating defects. And so you get some kind of um, maximum at intermediate values. Well, the, let me just illustrate kind of the consequences of, uh, of these strongly varying diffusion coefficients. Now that we have these diffusion coefficients, what we can do is we can perform kind of a, a continuum level simulation or, or kind of analysis. Um, these crystallites, they, they form typically as kind of little hexagonal platelets. Um, and so we can uh, kind of crudely approximate it as, as a cylindrical geometry. And in that geometry, then the diffusion equation, the fixed second law has, th has this form in cylindrical coordinate system. And we can plug in now this strongly varying diffusion coefficient uh, when we're solving for the kind of profiles, the, the lithium composition profiles inside uh, this particle as you're moving lithium. So that's illustrated over here. So assume that we're charging the crystallite, we're removing lithium from the surface, uh, and we start with a fully integrated compound. Each of these curves corresponds to the lithium composition. So this is the origin. This is kind of at the origin of in cylindrical coordinates of our crystallite. And this is kind of the radial coordinate moving out to the surface. And this is the surface over here. And this is the composition profile inside this crystallite at different times, so increasing times. So initially, you've got kind of, uh, it's fully lithiated. And as you start charging, you start moving lithium from the surface. Well, if you have a strongly composition-dependent diffusion coefficient, what happens is that um, you get these very steep gradients in the concentration profile. Here at the surface, the composition is, is you've removed some lithium ions, where the diffusion coefficient is high, it's kind of really close to its maximum value, uh, whereas in, at the interior, the composition is still is, is high, where the diffusion coefficient is, is low. So here, the diffusion coefficient is very low, here it's very high, and in order, if we're extracting lithium at a, at a constant flux, in order uh, to sustain that flux, you need to introduce enormous gradients uh, to, to drive diffusion from the interior to the, to the surface. And these gradients become larger the, the larger the flux. So the, the faster you charge, you can expect larger gradients. Um, so what happens is, uh, because of this strongly varying diffusion coefficient, 
you create these steep gradients, and because the lattice parameters are very sensitive to, um, to the composition, you can expect enormous strain gradients, and therefore internal stresses to build up uh, around these uh, uh, concentration gradients. And that leads to fracture of your particle, or could potentially lead to fracture of your particle. So the more rapidly you charge and discharge, the steeper your gradients, and therefore the, the more likely the, the particle is to, to fracture because of these steep gradients. Okay, so that kind of wraps up kind of what I wanted to say about lithium batteries. I don't know how much time I, I have. Ten minutes. Ten minutes, okay. Um, as I, if you remember, as I said in the beginning, I, I made a distinction between two types of phase transformations, diffusional kinetic processes, and that's kind of what I've described here. Um, and, and what I've shown is we can predict both thermodynamic and kinetic properties, so the diffusion coefficients from first principles. Uh, but there also, there's also um, another type of phase transformation, which are structural phase transformations. So what I want to do is give um, an, an illustration of how we can uh, predict structural phase transformations. Um, now this is actually in a hydride, and it's um, a structural transformation of a titanium dihydride. And technologically, this is not very important. Um, we were studying for in, in terms of, we were studying this system for hydrogen embrittlement uh, properties, so we were trying to calculate this phase diagram, and we uh, discovered this, or learned about this, this phase, uh, this phase transformation, where you take um, this hydride, and at high temperature it has cubic symmetry, and as you cool it down uh, below about 300 Kelvin, uh, it undergoes a, tetrag a cubic to tetragonal phase transformation. It becomes cubic at high temperature, tetragonal at low temperature. And in this system, the titanium ions form a kind of FCC crystal structure, and the hydrogen ions reside at, in the tetrahedral interstitial sites. Um, so we wanted to uh, understand this phase transformation and use similar statistical mechanical techniques to, to, anal to analyze. Now typically, at least a material scientist would rationalize a a uh, structural phase transformation, at least at, at a first approximation, in terms of a, a kind of a Landau description. And basically what we do is we identify some order parameter, which in this case is the C over A ratio of your cubic crystal, and that's equal to 1 if it's cubic, because all the lattice parameters are equal, so you have cubic symmetry, and it's uh, not equal to 1 when you've got a tetragonal distortion. One lattice parameter is, let's say, contracted, and the two other ones are expanded. And you'd expect, for example, at low temperature, uh, so in terms of this order parameter, then uh, in a Landau description, you introduce kind of a, a free energy, a coarse grain free energy, uh, as a function of this order parameter. So we assume that at fixing the C over A ratio, we can still calculate a, a free energy as a function of the C over A ratio. And we expect to find two local minima, one for the tetragonal phase and the other one for the cubic phase. And at, high te at low temperature, the tetragonal phase has a lo lower minimum and the cubic phase is a higher one, that's why the tetragonal is stable at low temperature. But as you increase the temperature, these relative heights shift because of vibrational differences in vibrational entropy, for example, and you get the cubic phase local minimum to be lower than that of the tetragonal phase. And so when these local minima are at the same height, that corresponds to the transition temperature. So that's kind of the, the first uh, approximation of how we would try to interpret this kind of phase transformation. So we what we can do is um, we can actually calculate, at least at zero Kelvin, we can calculate these energies. Um, so at zero Kelvin, there's no entropy, so the free energy is just the energy. Um, by solving the Schrodinger equation, we can calculate these energies as a function of the C over A ratio. And this is the curve that we get. And notice we do get two minima, but if you look carefully, you see that at C over A equal to one, which is the cubic phase, we get a maximum, not a local minimum, which implies that this cubic phase is actually mechanically unstable. If you had this cubic phase present and there was any thermal fluctuations, the thing would spontaneously uh, distort to the tetragonal phase. So it's quite, quite surprising because at high temperature, this cubic phase is actually observed experimentally. So it, it forms, but at zero Kelvin, the first principles predictions indicate that it's mechanically unstable and, and you wouldn't expect it to form. So one possibility is that as you increase temperature, other um, excitations start kicking in, for example, electronic excitations, and they could possibly alter this, the, the shape of this curve. And that's something we can at least to some approximation do in, with uh, density functional theory. We can, we can kind of estimate the effect of, sorry, we can estimate the effect of, um, of uh, electronic excitations um, and recalculate now the free energy due to, due to um, electronic excitations. And we get at 300 Kelvin uh, this curve. Notice it's still a maximum. But as we increase the temperature, you see that the curve kind of starts to flatten out. The cubic phase is still a maximum. And we have to go to actually about 1,200 Kelvin before the cubic phase 
uh, becomes a local minimum and the tetragonal phase is no longer a local minimum. So this implies that um, potentially electronic excitations could cause this system, um, which is where the cubic phase is mechanically unstable, uh, to become stable at high temperature. The problem is that it experiments, the transition temperature is 300 Kelvin, whereas what we predict is 1200 Kelvin. Now DFT, when predicting excitations, can only be kind of uh, interpreted as, as qualitatively accurate. So it's possible that this is the correct picture, um, but that uh, DFT is just kind of quantitatively not very accurate. But there's another possibility, and that is that um, as you increase the temperature, another possibility is that the system actually starts to thermally vibrate. Uh, and uh, note that uh, in this cubic to tetragonal transition, there are actually uh, three equivalent tetragonal variants. You can compress the crystal in, in, the, in the z direction, or in the x direction, or in the y direction. And one possibility is that as you increase temperature, um, the system starts to fluctuate, and above a certain temperature, there's enough thermal energy for the system to sample all three variants with equal probability. And so if you do an XRD measurement of your, of your crystal, um, essentially what you're getting is an average over the three tetragonal variants, and it, you, you get a diffraction pattern that appears cubic, because you're averaging over the diff different variants with equal probability. So that's an, another possible mechanism with which this uh, cubic to tetragonal transition could occur. So to, to explore that, what we did was we used again kind of an equivalent or similar technique, but now instead of looking at configurational degrees of freedom, looking at vibrational excitations, what we did was we developed a, a Hamiltonian for anharmonic vibrational degrees of freedom, um, essentially to describe the energy of the crystal as you start perturbing the atoms. Um, so the energy that it would sample if the crystal starts to uh, vibrate. Um, and we can write that energy as kind of an energy of, of the reference cubic crystal plus correction terms in terms of the, these are all deformation variables for, for the different sites of your crystal. Um, we've got these uh, pair cluster terms to correct uh, triplets and so forth. And so for example, one way to describe these, these pair interactions is just simple spring model, so kind of a harmonic approximation. Uh, all these atoms are attached by springs, so if you start perturbing them, then the energy goes up parabolically. But if you want to be able to describe a cubic to triangle transition, you have to do more than just introduce these pair terms. You have to introduce um, higher order terms, so for example, four body terms, um, which instead of describing in terms of, uh, of displacement variables, we can also uh, represent in terms of uh, strains of your crystal. So it's essentially, these are polynomials that describe how the energy of the crystal changes um, if you deform all these four point clusters in your crystal. Okay? So um, now having introduced those strains, uh, it's very useful to um, introduce actually a new set of metrics, new set of strain metrics, where you, if you take the diagonal elements of your, of your strains of your crystal, you get um, a dilation, so a measure of how much the volume changes of your crystal. And you can introduce these linear combinations of your uh, elastic strains, um, which are the deviatoric uh, terms, and then you've got your shear strains. And in terms of these devi deviatoric metrics, um, these are very useful because it allows you in a 2D plot to represent the three tetragonal variants. So compression along the uh, z direction, if you long this axis E3, uh, the crystal is compressed along the z-axis. Here it's, it's expanded. If you rotate this axis by 120 degrees along this dashed line, you're, you're now looking at compression in the x-direction or, or expansion in the x-direction. And then rotate again another 120 degrees, you get compression in the y-direction and expansion in the y-direction. So these are very useful metrics to describe cubic to triangle transition. Well, so what we did was we took our Hamiltonian. This is the Hamiltonian now that describes kind of the, the degrees of the, the energy as, as a function of vibrational degrees of freedom. Um, and we parameterize all the expansion coefficients uh, by solving the Schrodinger equation for a few uh, deformations. So we're essentially fitting these coefficients. And then this is the energy landscape that we get from this Hamiltonian as a, in terms of E2 and E3. And you see we've got three local minima corresponding to the three different tetragonal variants. They're symmetrically equivalent, so all three are equivalent. And here at E2 equal to zero and E3 equal to zero, um, that corresponds to the cubic phase. So in that case, the crystal is completely cubic. And in this energy contour plot, you see that the cubic phase is predicted to be a maximum. So it's kind of the, the maximum uh, uh, tip of this energy landscape. And, and you've got these three local wells. So we implemented that in Monte Carlo and then uh, calculated, for example, the average lattice parameters as a function of temperature. And we see that even though the Hamiltonian, the energy description, 
predicts a maximum for this cubic phase, which means it's mechanically unstable. If we look at it at finite temperature, where thermal excitations are, are kicking in, we see that we get actually a phase transition from the tetragonal phase to a cubic phase. So we have tetragonal symmetry at low temperature, we have this cubic phase at high temperature. So how do we, how do we understand this? This will be my last slide before the conclusion. Um, so this is, it's, it's useful to refer back to this kind of energy diagram. So how do we understand this formation of, of the cubic phase at high temperature, even though it's mechanically unstable? Um, well, um, what we can do is, from the Monte Carlo, we can plot uh, averages of these metrics, E2 and E3. And if you look at this plot, this is a function of temperature. Uh, you see you've got a finite E3 value at low temperature and a zero E2 at low temperature. So essentially you're starting in this local well, and then as you heat up, E3 progressively decreases, so you're moving up along this axis. And then what appears to be happening is, um, at this transition temperature, you get the cubic phase, because now e the average of E3 and E2 are zero. But this is kind of a naive way of interpreting this, this, this data. What you really should be looking at is the average of the absolute value of E2 and E3, because essentially what's happening is this thing is vibrating back and forth in this well. And so you're sampling positive and negative values of E2 with equal probability. If you're just taking its average, they cancel out and you get zero. But if you take the average of the absolute value, um, it's not equal to zero because this system is, is vibrating in this local well. So as you heat up, um, what happens is this E2, the average of E2 increases, the, uh, the average of the absolute value of E3 decreases. And essentially what's going on is you're, you're kind of vibrating in this well, at the transition temperature, you have now enough thermal energy for the system to actually overcome these barriers, these saddle points, and the system now samples uh, phase space with um, kind of cubic symmetry, with equal probability, uh, you're, you're sampling kind of E2 and E3 with equal probability in the circular symmetry, and therefore giving the appearance of a cubic phase. So it's, a, it's kind of a, a mechanism with which a high temperature phase that is mechanically unstable at zero Kelvin can be stabilized at, at finite temperature through large anharmonic uh, um, vibrational degrees of freedom. So let me uh, conclude. I hope I've um, demonstrated that we, that, that we can predict thermodynamic properties of these complex intercalation compounds used in batteries. Um, a crucial aspect there are configurational degrees of freedom. Um, we've also... Um, I hope I've been able to also demonstrate that we can uh, predict uh, structural phase transformations by looking at vibrational excitations. We can also predict kinetic properties, things like diffusion coefficients and, and, and in the future phase transformations. And then kind of put this out there. Um, there's still a lot of fundamental questions just even about the thermodynamics and the kinetics of, of uh, electrode particles at the, at the nanoscale. So thank you very much for all your attention. Well, in the Monte Carlo, yeah, you have, to, you have to converge your results with size of the system, and, and above a certain size, it no longer, your results no longer change. Right? It's periodic boundary conditions. So, so it, it's as if it's in a, in a kind of infinite crystal. But if you wanted to, to simulate, for example, nanoparticle, you'd have to include effects of surfaces, and they would start affecting the interior of your bulk. Um, it's something... Right. You have to you have to explicitly include a, a surf, the surface effects, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, you explained that the Hughesian coefficient by uh, assuming the the dye vacancy, but uh, dye vacancy will still still be unstable in a especially in a material where we have fifty percent vacancies. It is cost energy. The cation and vacancy will repulse each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the dye vacancies—they actually the vacancies do repel each other. They don't want to be together. Um, uh, but because at at finite temperature you get dye vacancies just by entropy, just by thermal excitations, they sometimes get pushed together. And once they're together, they start moving around and really start shuffling the lithium ions around. So if you, for example, plot the average composition of dye vacancies and you compare it to the va va the vacancy composition squared, you get a value that's less than just what you'd expect if it's completely random. 
So there is a tendency for vacancies to repel each other. But because it's at finite temperature, they, they're present. How is that interpreted in this equation? Where you're putting the diffusion coefficient to be the highest at 0.5? Oh, at 0.5, there's plenty of divacancies. There, because there's so many vacancies. So wouldn't that be more stable to have one vacancy, one cation, and one more vacancy with the kind of situation where you in, in a lot of these intercalation compounds, in, in, the, in the titanium disulfide, at 300 Kelvin, it's disordered. So the, the ordering tendency is, is much weaker than in, in oxides, typically. Yeah. But if you go to low enough temperatures, you would get ordering. Oh, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, question for the thermodynamic analysis. Uh, the question for the thermodynamic calculation of lithium X is to be sure this uh, huge plot right where you have I don't know, 200 calculations in this. Yeah. No, no, no. You, you allow the whole. You allow everything to relax internally. Everything yes. has to relax, right? Right. So at different axes, you're actually then proposing different volumes. Yeah, the system. The system adopts a different yeah. volume. Even for different ordering, you're going to get different different volumes, right? Yeah. So would it matter what kind of GGA you're using? Yeah, I'm using LDA, and and that's a good point. That's a, that's a good point. So, um, it turns out that, um, especially for the diffusion coefficients. Um, what happens is um, uh, the lattice parameters are, are very sen are sensitive to whether you use LDA or GGA. Uh, if you use GGA, you actually you can't use them on these materials because um, a lot of the binding between the sheets is a van der Waals effect, which which kind of keeps the sheets together, um, and and they're absent in both LDA and GGA. Now in GGA, if you actually calculate the energies with very little lithium, the slabs start to separate, whereas in experiment they contract, they get closer together. Um, with LDA, what happens is you have kind of an artificial overbinding, which even though you don't incorporate the effect of um, the van der Waals effect, um, it, somehow, it compensates for the, for the absence of the van der Waals effect in the LDA. So the lattice parameters are um, a little bit too small, but the trend is, um, it matches very, very closely what, what's observed experimentally. Um, so that's the technique I'm using because the diffusion coefficients are very sensitive to the lattice parameters and if I want to see trends in the, in the diffusion coefficients I need to have the right trends with, uh, with the lattice parameters, right? right. Yeah. I'm waiting for my group members to ask more questions before I jump in. There you go, Helen. I am not going for infinity. Um, if you could just go back to the little picture of the um, iron phosphate deinterpolation, showing how it's not as one would expect it to be mm -hmm. in the base of the crystal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> so can so your point is, of course, one that we understand in the field, which is the elastic energy is governing the size of these regimes and, and governing the effect. So is that something that's possible to actually calculate? Uh, yeah, it's it's just a continuum calculation. So all you need to know is the elastic moduli. Um, and we know the elastic moduli. We know the elastic moduli, right? And and the lattice misfit. And then it's basically the cost of straining one phase mm -hmm. and compressing the other phase mm -hmm. in different directions. Right. And it depends on phase fraction. And and uh, the the an analysis of coupling both to chemistry and mechanics is not that trivial. So deriving, essentially, you end up with a Instead of if you, if you just do chemical equilibrium, you have you have two equations. Chemical potentials of both phases have to be the same, um, and then you get your common tangent construction. If you couple that to um, strain, you have to you have to rederive equilibrium criteria, mm -hmm. where you both couple chemical equilibrium with mechanical equilibrium, and you have to solve for it simultaneously because it's 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 a long derivation, and and. Um, and then, then once you have that, you've got a variety of expressions that describe equilibrium. Uh, all you really need is a free energy curve and your elastic moduli, as well as kind of the lattice misfit, the strain misfit strains. So I gather and then the what explanation you, that you haven't done that yet. No, this, that's, that's the result, that's what this, these curves are. Um, these curves are the, the result of both mechano, ke, chemic, chemo-mechanical equilibrium. And if you use this morphology, you get this kind of a free energy of two-phase coexistence. So there's a, a penalty compared to just uh, two-phase two incoherent two-phase coexistence. Yeah. And uh, in this morphology, uh, the uh, strain energy penalty is lower. Mm 
Yeah, so that, that was actually my next question. So that black curve is actually calculated using elastic energy incorporated right. through this corporation. Right. So then you also should be able to predict um, if there is a size dependence to this elastic energy, I'm thinking of the famous domino cascade model of Delmas, where at some finite nano scale, some sort of size of a particle, that elastic energy is, uh, the energies that are driving this, mm -hmm. this two-phase formation are such that it is no longer energetically favorable for it to exist. To, to two-phase coexistence. Thus this, this, this so-called domino cascade model. And then my, so obviously my question is, if we're one, one has all the tools then to calculate that, what size would that be? Or have anyone calculated this? No, no one, no one uh, at least to my knowledge, you know, maybe there's a paper that's submitted somewhere, no one's calculated that. Um, that, that would be an extra level. So this is actually for macroscopic crystals where we can make kind of mechanical idealizations where, where we're using large homogeneous phases. Um, if we want to do that, um, it's a little more complicated because then you have to start incorporating finite element calculations and specifically take account of the geometry. Um, so we're, we're playing around with that, but we don't have any results where I can tell you so either way. So something that is in practice doable or approachable. Yeah. It's just right. Yeah, it gets a little more complicated because you have a lot more inhomogeneity spatially. Yes. So it becomes, instead of, you get vi variational equilibrium criteria instead of just simple equilibrium criteria, assuming homogeneous phases. Because the lithium composition is going to vary spatially depending on the inhomogeneous strain state throughout the for, throughout your particle. But in the effort to go more and more nanoscale in these uh, energy storage materials, we more and more need to understand what the benefits and the penalties for going nano are and how they relate to such factors such as these. So it is, I would think, rather important to try to get loose handles around this. Right, this, right. This finite yeah, I mean, there are other well, factors too. There's, there's surface energies yeah, that have that to be, too, exactly, sure. and uh, interfacial energies. And then, and then there's the question of, is this even accurate at the nanoscale, that, mm -hmm. that you have this interface migrating? Or does this just spontaneously happen at once, where you have kind of this fluctuation of lithium all simultaneously getting sucked in? Um, that, you know, that needs careful experiments and very hard thinking at a theoretical level to so answer. To my knowledge, nobody's really tackled this at the nanoscale that, I, that I'm really aware of. I'm not either, right? They haven't right. really asked, or they right. may have asked those hard questions, but they haven't right. done the hard <laughs> right. calculations to get to the answer. Right, yeah, right. right. Yeah. Okay. Um, go ahead, Rook. You can ask more questions. I have another one. I couldn't find it here. Uh, on the slide, we were just at ice. Would be the, the next one. Then uh, the crystal on the bottom, uh, the bottom right-hand side there, that is uh, partially uh, dilithiated. It's a mixture of dilithiated and phases. Is there anything in particular that is preventing the beta phase from completely turning into the alpha phase the way it is uh, drawn there? This is kind of at an intermediate trap state. Okay. So if you were to continue removing lithium ions, what happens is you'd have to extract it kind of at this interface because it's, it's the, it's, the interface moves laterally, so kind of upward. So the alpha is consuming this beta phase. Both of these alpha phases are kind of consuming inward. So in order for that to happen is you have to extract lithium essentially at the interface so that the interface can move laterally. So interface moves in a direction not perpendicular to lithium diffusion, as you would kind of kinetically expect according to this mechanism, but kind of parallel to lithium diffusion. So you're getting lithium diffusion, and then that kind of moves, the interface moves up. Um, is that in reasonable accord with, with a lot of uh, the models that have been predicted or, or observed by... Usually, like usually some, most, most models assume this kind of description. Okay. Um, it, it's equivalent to a core shell model, except the geometry is slightly different. Right. Um, this is, this is um, I mean, there are some models. Uh, uh, people are attempting to account for this after, after the discover, discovery from, um, uh, from, I guess, Richard's group um, of, this kind of, of this kind of morphology. Um, but you know, there, there are enormous challenges, because if you really want to model the kinetics of this, you have to couple to elasticity. And, and that just makes it so complicated. It's not only solving diffusion, but you have to also couple that to, to, the, to the mechanics, so the elasticity. And, and that's what's preventing people from actually doing it. But it's not impossible. It's just really hard. Right. Yeah. Concept, I mean, the equations, you can write them down. Right. You just have to numerically do it and write the code to do it. Right. 
I'm, I'm working with mechanical engineers to, to look into this kind of, kind of thing. Yes. What about possibly with a nucleation trigger for such a Because if you have more than one layers of uh, PE that has beta phase, then there must be some, uh, why do they start specifically at that position? Um, yeah, I, that I can't really, I can't answer. I mean, I can speculate, but um, I think, first of all, this is, we have, we have to be careful because this is chemically delithiated as well. So in a battery, the, the, the conditions are, are very different. Uh, you, you, this is immersed in an electrolyte. Um, the nucleation events could be very different from chemical delithiation. And then in real batteries, these particles are much smaller because you can't, you can't get, you can't electrochemically delithiate these. Um, so it's not clear how, how the, what the mechanism is in lithium batteries. Um, so that will require some experimentation. But a lot of just po potentially, I mean, let me speculate then. Um, you know, mechanisms could be uh, surface defects, right? Um, or some dislocation or some kind of a, a region where the, the elastic, there's some defect that causes large elastic strain energy that could be relieved by creating um, the new phase. Right? So that's, that's where it would then nucleate, and then it would continue to grow from there. That's kind of what I would speculate. Yes. Go ahead. If we count the mechanism <coughs> chairs, I, I know this uh, calculation is based on macroscopic chairs. If we can really make uh, those things kind of phosphate crystallize into nanosize, really small sizes, and uh, whether that upper left uh, it is usually to happen in that kind of system. Um, well, elasticity, elastically, this would, even at the nanoscale, this wouldn't be favored. Um, but the question is, would it even do any of this at the nanoscale? Right? It could just be a burst where some, because it's so small. I mean, it's, it's often it could be at the same length scale as typical fluctuations in composition that you would, that you would expect, um, kind of just from statistical mechanics. Um, so, I think it's it's really at this point unknown how, how that mechanism happens at the nanoscale. And so what I'm saying is we don't have to, we may not want to extrapolate um, what we understand at the macroscopic scale in terms of kinetics, uh, just extrapolate it down to the nanoscale. That, that probably isn't accurate. We can have a group meeting here, so if anyone else is bored. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, my question relates to the iron manganese olivine where there's some interesting questions about how electrons move around through the solid as well as how ions move around through the solid. So I guess um, a general question might be, have you looked at that system yourself? Lithium manganese? Uh, sorry, the iron manganese, as I said, lithium uh, iron manganese system. The, the mixture, iron the mixture, manganese. Yes. No, I have not. I have not looked at it. So you haven't given it some thought. My, my question is sort of a big one which concerns the fact that these are two different potentials and right. yet obviously there is a fairly free electron migration through that material mm -hmm. which has to either occur through a very highly percolating pathway at that same energy level or there has to be energy transfer between different energy levels between iron and manganese effectively mm -hmm. even at the lower, lower voltage plateau mm -hmm. and so is, have you given any thought about how that, I mean, are these the sorts of things that you can handle calculation-wise, computation-wise, I should say? First of all, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Kind of, yeah. Kind of, yeah. Should, can I make it, can I make it, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, okay, so the phosphates pose a real challenge for, for DFT methods. Um, <clears throat> if you just use LDA or GGA, it, it fails. You get completely wrong. Mm. You predict yeah, completely wrong. Really yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Right, exactly. So you have to use um, uh, this correction, DFT plus U, which to some degree is, is empirical. You have to choose U values and you kind of, you, you kind of play with them until you, you, you can calculate them self-consistently to some degree. Um, but typically what's done is you, you play with them until you, you correct your so experimental you're errors. Sort of like fitting them basically until you get the answer that right. it looks like it should be more or less. Uh, exactly, right. So the, the, um, uh, the, so, okay, so the, the complexity of now, of, of looking, so you've got usually coupling of magnetic ordering with um, charge ordering, um, and they're all very sensitive to what you use for you, 
They're also very sensitive about how you set up your initial calculation, where you kind of put charge and so forth. So the, the, the phase space is enormous, plus you have to do this one fitting thing where you have, to, you have to choose the correct values before you can start actually predicting things. Um, so that's, that's what's kept me from that. And Ket's been working on this for a while, and he's got a larger army of people, and it's not worth competing on, on that topic. <laughs> So, so that's why I'm, I'm not uh, playing around with that. But I do think it is, it is, it is very interesting, though, um, and it's, this is very fundamental. It's basically um, the coupling between charge order and lithium vacancy disorder mm -hmm. and the mobility, and then the fact that if you have an additional disorder in terms of iron and manganese... Well, effectively uh, just energy sites, we'll call them. Energy sites, are, right, yeah. yeah. Um, how how uh, um, these, these charges... Um, kind of migrate on this kind of disordered landscape. Um, so so if, if the issue of this correction to D, DFT can be, can be solved, then in principle all these techniques I've, des I've described can be applied. It's a little more complicated. Um, and then in, in kind of a kinetic Monte Carlo simulation, we can kind of simulate where do these char localized charges hang out, how do they migrate, how does that couple uh, to lithium uh, mobility. But so anything concrete I can't, I haven't. I haven't this you know, years and years of these irritating papers of dopants, including now the manganese phosphate system, where people see um, introduction of not not dopants in the sense of yet being chang the aliovalent dopants, but just other metals or sometimes even non-metals affecting kinetics and uh, of, mm -hmm. and in other words diffusion at least at some level, not usually so much the energetics of the diffusion that. Um, uh, and the diffusion of electrons effect because it's, it's also the electron and there's a, they form at different rates is what I'm trying to say mm -hmm. by methods and, uh, and what's going on there is just completely a mystery mm -hmm. and people seem to be sort of you know doping and scattering things hither thither and seeing that if they change the energetics just on the, on the metal lattice mm -hmm. that they can affect these things quite dramatically but it's but is that is that is it clear that that's what's happening that that's what they're affecting or no it's not okay all right that's yeah pure speculation, and yeah. this is a sort of area, area where computational chemistry or computational material science, I think, if the calculations will allow it, would really allow them to mm -hmm. see what these effects are at that level, because you're, it's a question really of how those energy levels are interacting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But as you said, you can't uh, really get there. I haven't, I haven't, you haven't. I, haven't, I haven't thought about trying it, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I can stop. Oh, yes, sir. I'm going to, can I get one question? Oh, yes. <laughs> before, we, before we have to close, close up, um, it's a very practical one. I have some other questions too, but I will do that later. Um, in, in a purely practical sense, what, what uh, have you learned here about uh, how to design the perfect lithium ion battery? How to design them? Well, for example, the diffusion, the diffusion studies, um, we're, we're kind of now taking that and looking at all kinds of different crystal structures. And so at this point, um, people speculate about, okay, this kind of crystal structure has higher mobility and there's some experimental evidence for that, but it's uh, convoluted with chemistry and other, and other factors, particle size and so forth. So it's not clear at a fundamental level how does crystal structure affect lithium mobilities. So in a, with these techniques, we can, in a very systematic way, um, predict, for example, the effect of crystal structure on lithium mobilities and there, thereby say, okay, this kind of crystal structure is ideal to optimize lithium mobilities. And then we can do the same thing for, for chemistry. So keep the crystal structure, change the chemistry, and see how the chemistry changes it. And, and that way, uh, we build much more insight about how to kind of push a system to optimize certain properties. Obviously, you always compromise other properties, but... Um, so the, the, the computational tools and methodologies you've developed are broadly applicable? Yeah, yeah. What sort of... Uh, for, for these, um, we use, uh, we, we have uh, something with a, a cluster with about 96 CPUs. Um, uh, if we want to do more complicated systems, we need larger ones. Uh, but what I've shown you is, is all doable with, with that kind of description. Um, and also, it depends also on the quantity of, of what you want to put. Yeah. Well, last, any last questions? We can follow up with Okay, well, uh, let me uh, close by uh, thanking Dr. Van, Van der Ven for yep. a beautifully illustrated and uh, expertly articulated uh, 
uh, seminar on how to gain a fundamental understanding of the, the, the changes in thermodynamic path parameters which accompany uh, structural changes in lithium uh, yeah. materials. So thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah.